Welcome to Anaheim Stadium. You, along with 70,035 people, will enjoy the eighth consecutive sellout of the Nippendenzo Supercross Classic in Anaheim Stadium. Brought to you by Nippendenzo Spark Plugs, the official Supercross Spark Plug, and by Suzuki. Works like a single moving part. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Anaheim Stadium, the site of the 1986 Supercross kickoff, the Nippendenzo Supercross Classic. I'm Greg Barbakovian, and along with my buddy Dave Stanfield here, we're going to have a super event tonight. It's going to be great. The toughest track ever, the best track ever, according to David Bailey. You'll be down on the track with many of the factory stars, so I wonder if you can tell us who should we be looking for to take home the gold? Well, we're looking for Team Suzuki. They're very strong. The Honda team, they've got... Ricky Johnson, David Bailey, Johnny O'Mara, uh, the last year defending champion, Brock Lever on his Yamaha, and we've got the one and two plates. That's the Team Green Kawasaki. It's Lachine and Jeff Ward, the Supercross champion of last year. The factory riders are always up on top, but here in 86 with the new production rule, which we'll explain later on, the privateers ought to have a much better shot at the number one plate. We've got plenty of action for you here tonight, and we'll be back at Anaheim Stadium right after this. What you're looking at now is the starting grid, and that 30-second sign in the middle of the starting area indicates to the riders that we are very close to the beginning of heat number one. Now, this is going to be eight laps long, and as soon as you see that 30-second sign tilt over to the side, that means that that starting gate, which drops down backwards towards the riders, could drop at any time. That guy in the red jacket's going to go bailing out of the center of the track real quickly. You'll see him running. Here they go. It's the beginning of the 1986 Nippendenzo Supercross Series. And the first rider into the first turn. Whoa, on the inside, number 102 is going to come blasting out of nowhere. Way on the inside, we had a super surprise there. That's Ron Turner, who for the first time ever is racing on a Yamaha. And there he is under his bike. Holy smoke, a tough break for the rider who just got going on a Yamaha this year. He rode Kachivas for the last couple of years. This is the first time he's on a red and white bike, and he ended up bailing. Now we go to another Yamaha rider who's got the lead. This is Mike Beyer. Mike used to race Hondas last year, but now you can see that he as well has switched over to the red and white brand. Now Mike has got a support ride with the factory, which means that they don't pay him a salary, but they keep him well stocked in parts and bikes that he can campaign on the circuit throughout the entire year. Behind him in the red jersey, Russ Wageman. Here they are, getting ready to come down into that big first corner, and whoa, that Yamaha in second place moving to the outside. That's number 86, Russ Wageman from Canoga Park. Russ Wageman used to race Suzuki's last year for the factory. He was dropped from the team, however. Some injuries hurt him last year. Right now, he's battling for his life, and on the inside, a super pass. Wageman in the red jersey, just barely on top of those moguls, as you can see, has now opened up a two-and-a-half, maybe even a three-bike length lead. Kawasaki's effort back in third place. That's number 17, Alan King. Alan, another rider who's got factory support. Through the moguls and up and over Ricky Johnson's obstacle. That's actually a tabletop hill that's mounted in a corner, which makes it real difficult to traverse. They go over the whoop-de-doos, through the sand, and you'll see him shooting back towards the finish line in just a second. Here we are, number 86, Wageman on top. Second place now belongs to Alan King. Alan's moved into the number two spot, so 34, Bayer, losing a little bit of momentum there. The race is over already. Take a look at the way that inside line was dominated by number 17, Alan King, and now it's a three-way race as Healing's right up on top of it all. Russ Wageman, only a few moments ago, had himself a three-bike link lead, and then all of a sudden, Alan King found an incredible reserve and flew right by him. Healy on the inside of Wageman, and he'll take over second place. Holy smoke, this is more exciting than almost the entire 1985 season put together. One of the complaints of Supercross last year was that the racing was not tight enough. Well, as you can see, Supercross's promoter, Mike Goodwin, sure has designed an excellent track tonight because in the very first race, we've seen some incredible passing. 
Number 17 on a Kawasaki with the lead, Alan King. I don't believe Alan has ever taken an overall win in a Supercross race. Remember, this is only the first qualifier. By winning, he would transfer directly to the main, something that would obviously give him an advantage because he would be able to rest both his bike and his body between now and then. Second place, that's Mike Healy. Mike's in the second year of his relationship with the United States Suzuki. And Healy's really beginning to push on Allen. Right now, they're approaching center field in Anaheim Stadium. Healy is looking for a way to try and dive underneath Allen on that inside. Allen likes to gun towards the outside of, the, of those berms. As I told you before, staying on the gas and using that outside line to keep his momentum up. Healy's been looking for an inside line where he can just plant his foot, turn the bike around quickly, and jam for an open slot. So far, hasn't able, been able to pull it off. Whoa, there on the outside. Look at him get out of shape. They're both in trouble. Wageman is going to take the lead back. Holy cadavers, is this an event? Whoa, it's a whole new battle for first place. Now Wageman is forced off the track. He gets back on at just the last possible second and regains the lead. Folks, you are witnessing one of the most incredible Supercross heat races that have ever existed here. That's number 34, Mike Byer. And then coming up right behind him, boy, mean big time on the outside, that's Jeff Hicks barnstorming his way up from fifth place and now really trying to push into third. He's in third and second place now. He makes second place. So, so far, only halfway through the event, he has already moved up quite a few positions and now beginning to set his approach on Russ Wageman's Yamaha in the lead. On the outside, he, he's on the outside, doesn't quite pull it off. Now, both of them go up the doubles. Whoa! Look at the way his helmet bounced up off of the cross pad of the handlebars. His helmet was just thrown back because apparently he hit either his chin or his cheekbone or something. Some part of his head took a real nasty knocking as he came back down out of the air and slammed into the ground on that tough, jagged rut that Supercross is so well known for. So you've got Hicks in the lead in the red and white. That's Wageman in second place. And now approaching from back in third, you've got number 10 on a Suzuki, one of the factory riders, A.J. Whiting. Back to Hicks. Let's see whether or not he can stay in the lead. Well, there goes A.J. right behind him. Hicks will take the win on the last corner. A.J. Whiting moves into second place. Now we go back and we do it all again. It's the second heat race, and just like before, the top four finishers will have the privilege, the luxury, of transferring directly into the main. And here we go. The start of the second heat. Now in this race, we've got Holly and Burnworth, and they're in first and second place. Whoa, big time bail right there on the start breaker. Let's hope that he gets back up and okay. Once again, it's Holly in the lead. Holly in the white jersey on a Yamaha behind him in the black and orange. That is Scott Burnworth, a former Suzuki rider in second place, but Holly, the man right there, number 12, just off of a hot, hot win at the World Supercross Finals at the Los Angeles Coliseum a couple of months ago. Jim Hawley was a privateer up until this season, but after winning the World Supercross Finals overall standings, beating quite a few of the world's top Europeans, Yamaha Factory saw fit to reward him with a full factory contract. And now we've got a tight dogfight for first and second place. Burnworth passes him on the doubles. That's Scott Burnworth, who used to run for Suzuki, and this year has switched over to Yamaha. Boy, apparently he's adopting that brand new bike pretty well. Number 18, Scott the Burner, one of the younger riders on the circuit, really making that Yamaha click out there on the backside. Up and through the sand pit right there, one of the most treacherous obstacles, but we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Right now, let's watch Burnworth as he finishes up lap number two of this event. Scott Burnworth, who comes out of El Cajon, just like quite a few of the top racers here on the Supercross circuit, earned the number nine plate last season. Here you can see that he's running number 18 on his machine since he did switch factories over to the Yamaha brand. He was ranked number nine in Supercross, according to the AMA and InSport, back in 1985. Number 12, Holly down in second place. Looks like number 47 trying to keep up behind him. That's Ali Samar from New Iberia, Louisiana. That's the guy who used to run locally. Now you can see Burnworth gets the checkered flag with one hand up in the air. Holly's barely going to be able to hold off Ali, it looks like, at the finish line. Indeed he does. Samar is going to have to be content with third place. Number 22 coming up in fourth. That's another local, Brian Myers cop. Let's go down to the field and Dave Stanfield. Did it again, Burner. Did you hear the crowd yelling when you made that triple jump? 
Yeah, I did. I could hear them every time I went around there. It sounds like every time I didn't jump it, they got bummed out. Oh, I know. Well, you you got to win, and you've got to play it easy. You had a big lead, and that was your strategy, just to win. Yeah, I just kind of took it easy because I was real nervous and uh, just tried to make it come through. Okay, the track, is it going to hold up? Is it going to be like this all night long? Yeah, the track's really good right now. It's not bad at all. Best of luck. Great race. Thank you. The head man of the Bad Boy Club, Rick Johnson, you're really not a bad boy, but you've got an image kind of similar to Bob Hanna when he was racing. In fact, on the top of your helmet, we see another dog here. Now, what is that? Well, that's a mad dog. Uh, it was with me in 1983 when I won my championship, and now it's back on my helmet for 86. You won that championship in the 250 class. Is that your favorite uh, class to ride in? Yeah, it is my favorite because I'm more at home on a 250, uh, and also we ride Supercross, so it gives you more time to get used to the motorcycle. Thank you, Dave Stanfield. And we're back at Anaheim Stadium on the starting line for the third qualifier. And ladies and gentlemen, this race here may very well be a sneak preview of what the main event is going to look like because in this event right here, you have got David Bailey, Ricky Johnson, and Johnny O'Mara all in the same grid. We're going to have a start any second right now. The gate falls backwards, and here we go. Barreling their way down to the first turn. Looks like Bailey on the inside. Here they come, blasting onto the corner. And look at that, Ricky Johnson stuffs Bailey in the corner. That's something you're not going to see too often. Ricky, a little bit younger than David, doesn't have quite the experience of the little professor out there on the track. Nonetheless, Team Han has got a lot of faith in him. And there's the green flag. That means that we've got a perfectly legal and safe start, and the race will continue. Remember, this is the third qualifying heat right here. The top four finishers in this qualifier transfer directly to the main. They don't have to do any more racing, so they can rest. Fifth place on, they can come back during the semi, and dead last place, well, they're out of it for the entire night. Number five, Ricky Johnson, rider that Honda has got a lot of faith in for this coming season, just switched over to Honda from the factory Yamaha, and look at that, that's the reason why Honda's got so much faith in him, he just cleared the triple jumps. Now, he's only the second rider to do that. You saw Burnworth do that just a few moments ago during the second qualifier. And here, apparently, Ricky Johnson feels that he's got to jump over all three of them to maintain the gap over his stablemate, David Bailey. Ricky's number five in the blue jersey on a Honda. And behind him, number six, David Bailey, a teammate on Honda, but he's running red. Even though they're teammates, the reason they're running different colored jerseys is because these riders, many of them, have different colored sponsors. As far, whoa, what a pass right there at the finish line. Bailey is able to swoop on down through the inside and go blasting right by RJ. Again, the way to tell them apart is by the colors that they're wearing. They're both on Hondas, but Bailey's in the red and Johnson is in the blue. What we started to say is different sponsors have different colored jerseys, and that's the reason why these two stable mates do appear to have the two different colors out there. Again, Johnson in blue, Bailey in red. Halfway through the event right now, and look at the way that Johnson came very close to getting that inside line. Just as that corner you saw right there, that run in the inside slowed him down a bit while David took the smoother outside berm so that he could maintain the speed that he had going into the corner. Now we better watch out. There's a couple of lap riders right in front. Bailey with a nice, clean cut on the inside. Got that one lap rider out of the way quickly. Johnson having a little bit of trouble passing the other lapper. Now back down to that treacherous sand pit. You can see the giant roosts of sand that get kicked back up in the rider's face as another rider goes blasting on by. That's the reason why each of these riders have goggles. And there's the checkered flag that's going to bring the race to an end. A surprise last-minute win by David Bailey, number six over number five, Ricky Johnson. Let's go down to the winner's circle and see what Dave Stanfield has to ask. Tough heat, David. Congratulations. Now, is there any advantage riding with somebody as fast as Ricky Johnson? Well, we could watch each other's lines a little bit. Of course, I had the advantage of being behind him a little bit and seeing some of the things he was doing and try and find a few things that I did better. And uh, then I got by him, and then he was studying my lines, and I noticed the places I was catching up to him before, he was right on my tail, so he picked up on a few of my lines. And I think we helped each other a little bit. Just hopefully, uh, some of these other guys are going to go out there and find any lines too fast. Do you guys feel that uh, the Team Honda is the fastest team tonight? I sure hope so. You never can tell until the race. I know there's been times when Honda has won every single heat race, and it's just looking good. Everyone's got smiles in the main event. You know, we uh, all have bad luck, and Kawasaki or something wins the finals. So we'll just have to keep our fingers crossed. Hey, best of luck tonight. All right, thank you.
Back to you, Greg. Only the top four transfer directly to the main. If you finish worse than fourth, you got to come back and run the semi. And here we go. We got to start. This is the final qualifier. And Brock Lever dive bombs to the very first position. On the inside is Jeff Ward, and Ward may catch him. He does. And so does Lachine. My goodness, those Kawasaki's really exploded out of the corner. Ward on top, Lachine in second, and now Keo goes as well as Brock drops all the way down to fifth place. That is unusual. Now Ward is off the track. Number one, Wardy pulled completely off the track. We have no idea what's wrong. We'll try and get that information to you as soon as we can. But right now, young Ron Machine, number two, in his first year of competition for Kawasaki, finds himself in the lead. Fourth final qualifier here at Anaheim Stadium. Eric Kehoe, number eight, in second place. As I mentioned, he's from Southern California as well. Eric, one tough rider this season. He earned the number eight slot in the Supercross standings during 1985. There's a real good shot of Jeff Ward right there as his mechanics are working on something on the front end of his bike, something up on the handle grips right there. Wardy turning his back on, oh, he's taking his gloves off. It looks like he's gonna be done for the night. Apparently his mechanics aren't gonna be able to get it back together, otherwise he never would have even taken his goggles off. Let's get back to the action now in a very tight race for second place. Number eight, that's Eric Kehoe, another factory Suzuki rider behind him. Brock Lover on the inside, number four, blasts to the inside and Kehoe comes right back. Kehoe did the triples, just like we saw Ricky Johnson do a little bit earlier, and that's how he regained second place over the rider from El Cajon. Number two in the lead, Ron Lachine. A lot of controversy has been around this youngster this year. He's making a lot of money this season, switching over to the Kawasaki factory. Here's his chance to prove that he's worth every single dollar out in front, leading the way in this qualifier number three. You can see the white flag out. That means that there's just one lap left to go, a signal to these riders that they can go all out at this point for only one further lap. Right now, this is for bragging rights. Second place, Glover on the inside tried to pull a block pass off on number eight, Keo, but it didn't work. He went too far to the outside, and Keo was able to slide right back in, and there, Keo eats a hay bale. Keo goes ahead and snuffs his helmet right into the hay bale. Holy smoke, he's not going to have any need for lunch tonight. Number two out in the lead all by himself now. Machine's going to have a very comfortable lead here. Glover should be pretty well on his own in second place. And poor number eight, Keho. well, give him a napkin. That's about all that he can use right now as he's desperately still trying to get back out on the track. The finish flag will be out. There it is, the black and white checkered number two, Ron the Machine Lachine. Hugh Kawasaki, factory rider, takes the third qualifying win. Let's go down to the field and see what David Stanfield and Ron have to say. Ron, do you call that racing? You're kind of out there solo. Well, I call that my kind of race and my favorite kind. Yeah. Hey, we heard some bad news now. Your teammate, uh, Jeff Ward, is out. Is that put a little pressure on you going into the main event? Well, it'll just make it a little easier for me if it does anything. Uh, Jeff's a real good contender. That's, uh, that's too bad that happened to him, but uh, it's happened to me uh, about a year ago, and uh, I feel it was terrible. Is this your track? Well, I sure hope so. I'm going to try and make it my track. All right. Best of luck for the team. Thanks. Back to you, Greg. Thanks, David. We'll be back with more action at Anaheim, California, as the Nippendenzo Supercross Classic continues. Welcome back to Anaheim Stadium, the Nippendenzo Supercross Classic. There's a good look at Johnny O'Mara, number three. Swollen knee and all, getting ready for the first of two semi events. Now, this is the race for riders who did not finish in the top four positions. Remember, positions five through 14. Wait a minute, what's this? Jeff Ward, number one, trying to pull onto the starting gate. The AMA, that's the referee right there in the red jacket, says, no way, Jose. Remember, Jeff Ward took dead last place in that qualifier. We saw the pictures where his mechanics were working on the handle grip, so Ward is not eligible for this race. So let's go back to the starting gate. Johnny O'Mara, number three, he's staring down at the gate, and he's on the inside. He's gonna have a good shot at the whole shot right here. There's number 20 on a Kawasaki trying to bridge around him on the outside. So a great start for the O Show, a former Supercross champion. He won the title just a year and a half ago. Back out here tonight despite that knee injury, which has really given him a pain. He's only at about 75% after a nasty get-off a couple of weeks ago. Right now in a Kawasaki, starting to move up a little bit behind him. The guy who almost nailed him on the start. And right there, a beautiful pass on the inside. Number 20, Rick Ryan from San Jose as the green flag goes up. And we do have an official start. 
Ryan went up in the air on one of those small whoop de doos and when he came down, he positioned his bike between Johnny L and the next corner. A very effective way to pass as Johnny was just effectively screen doored out. Now, back to the wide straightaway. That's the start breaker jump you see right there, focusing in on your number two rider, number three on his plate. Of course, it's the second position, Johnny O'Mara. There's your leader, number 20, Ana Kawasaki, with your Ryan. If he is a support rider, whoa, look at the way he went completely off the pegs, and that sent him into the hay bales. Ryan looked like he was in trouble, and there's another rider down after trying to triple. Ryan looked like he was in trouble off the bat when his foot slipped off the foot peg there. As you saw, he just went bam right into the hay, so that will give the lead right back to the O Show. Johnny O on top. It looks like Mike Healy, another young Suzuki pirate in second place. Healy's from just around the corner here in Anaheim. He lives in Costa Mesa. He's been a Suzuki factory rider for all of a year and a half. I'll take that back. It's been two full years now. And the O Show with the lead. Healy in second place. It's Honda versus Suzuki here in this 250cc semi. Johnny flipping away one of his tear-offs right there. That's a thin shield of plastic which repels dirt. You flip them off when the dirt begins to collect on the plastic and you can't see anymore. You tear it off and there's another clean one right below that restores your vision. Johnny O in the blue jersey. There's Healy tearing off one of his tear-offs off of his goggles. He's in the yellow. Again, a Suzuki rider. It's like back behind them both. We've got number 24, Billy Miles. Race continuing on. Now, in this semi-event, only the top two riders will transfer to the main event. We've already got the top four riders from each of the four qualifying heats. That's 16. Take two from this race, two from the next semi, and then one final rider from the last chance qualifier, making it a 21-rider main event. And that is the basis from which all of the money, all of the points, and, of course, the trophies are awarded. Here's the checkered flag. No problem at all for the O Show after the early goings on. Healy will take second place, and indeed, number 24, Billy Lyles from Georgia, will take third. Let's go down to Dave Stanfield on the field. Honey, you don't see too often that you've got to qualify in a semi-main. How is your leg? Well, it's not very good. Um, I wish I could say it's good, and I wish I could say I'm going to be in there for the win, but I'm just here to try to get some points and uh, so I don't fall too far behind in points. And uh, cause my knee's pretty banged up. I got a couple torn ligaments, and... You know, I, I'm not making any excuses. It's just uh, it's a lot of pain out there. And then when I crashed in that heat race, I bent it back pretty far, and it hurts. <laughs> Thanks for your time, Johnny. Thank you very much. Back to you, Greg. An injured Johnny O is going to limp back in and see if he's going to go into the main event. All eyes on the starting line are focused on the 32nd side. It's sideways, and the big story right now is that Jeff Ward apparently is not going to make the main event. More on that in just a second. Let's go back to the start and see who's going to get to the first turn. First, there's Eric Kehoe in the middle. However, he went too far to the outside, and it looks like number 37, Billy Frank, out of orange, is going to escape with the hole shot. So Frank out on top. Looks like a Honda in second place. Billy Frank, number 37, is a Yamaha rider this season. One of the guys to be watching out for, it looks like number eight, Eric Kehoe, as well as number nine. Whoa, look at the way, sideways right there. That's number 30, Larry Brooks on a Honda. Larry came off the line in third place, but now you see him in second place right behind your leader, Frank. There's number eight, Keo. Nine, a great pass right there. Moving from fourth into third, that's Keith Bowen on a Yamaha. Keith has got a full factory support from the Yamaha team there, and now he's hot dogging it right behind Brooks. He's in third place, Brooks in second, Frank, of course, the leader. Back in fourth place there, the yellow bike in the distance, that's a Suzuki rider, Eric Keo. So a great shot of our top four, and now the dicing begins. Once again, this is a semi, which means only the top two will transfer into the main. After this point, it's only the last chance qualifier that riders will have the opportunity to go ahead and move into that all-important main event at the end of the evening here at Anaheim Stadium. The opening round of the Nippon Denzo Supercross Series. Whoa, look at number nine, Bowen, make another dive bomb move again. Almost moved all the way up into the lead through the sand pit right there. He almost went over the top of Brooks and came right up alongside Frank before he had to back off the throttle. Now a great race for first and second place. Two Yamaha pilots nearly side by side out there in dead center field at Anaheim Stadium. Coming back this way, up and over the plateau jump. Short rockers, inverted cones. Look at the way that the suspension on these machines has to handle the... 
coming back. Whoa, Brooks doing a flying W right there. Number eight, Kehoe. Kehoe goes by Brooks. He jumped over the sand pit completely. Did you see that? His tires didn't touch sand at all. I guess he had time to clean the hay out of his teeth after that last time that we saw him out there, huh? So back to our leaders, number nine, Bowen, trying to make another move on the inside. This time, he's got enough momentum to carry him into the lead. Number nine, Keith Bowen, he comes from Michigan, now moves into first place here in the final semi. Number nine, on the Yamaha, red leathers, white jersey, Keith Bowen, former Supercross Rookie of the Year. That was two and a half years ago now. Carrying the triples. One of the youngest riders on the Yamaha team, but nonetheless, they've got a lot of faith in him. They've stuck with him for the last two years. This is his third full season with the Yamaha back, back behind him. Frank in second place, Keo in third, Larry Brooks has now dropped way back into fourth. And look at the way his body has to work that suspension across the jagged whoops. Very difficult here. Some of those whoops have got a very hard packed surface. Well, some of them are very soft with a sandy surface. There's the checkered flag, the race is done. And for second place, whoa, look at this. Kehoe, block pass on the outside as he'll storm up and apparently is good for second place with one arm up in the air. Take a look at these vehicles on the starting line right now. Not two-wheeled, but four-wheeled. Suzuki quad racers, a very interesting aspect of Supercross. Let's go down to Dave Stanfield for a feature on these vehicles. We are set for the quad racers, and the quad racers, they're something special. They are four-wheel drive. This is a Suzuki one. The winningest motocross rider of all time, Bob Hurricane Hannah. What are you doing on a quad racer? Oh, I ride them for fun. Yeah? Can you tell us a little about the machine? Well, they're the newest thing in uh, the ATVs, you know, four wheels, pretty safe. You know, when it comes to that, you know, the whole family can ride them. They race them in the desert, the snow, the mud, the mountainous terrain, and, uh, you know, all sorts of things. The, the farmers are using them for towing light loads and just, just driving around the farm. They use them for all sorts of stuff like that. Basically, they're just fun, easy to ride, and safe for the whole family, you know, and, th and that, that's the biggest thing they're trying to do it. And the one most important thing is when you ride them, uh, they may be safe, but you still still wear a helmet all the time. All right, good job. Let's get ready for the race. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. Well, now that you know a little bit more about these Suzuki quad racers, let's see what they look like in action as they take the field out here at Anaheim Stadium. Well, it looks like we got a couple of guys going a little wide off there to the side. And here, one of them, holy smoke, he got lifted completely off the scene as he almost went up the side of one of the ramps there. These things can get out of control, just like any motorcycle, especially if they're not hidden under proper supervision. Take close note, you'll see that each one of these racers has got a helmet, shoulder pads, boots, gloves, and protected jersey and leathers on. Now we'll get a good look at our leader. There he is, number 309, Tim Dixon. Hasn't been racing him all that long, but he's got the top slot right now, and behind him is Paul Nicholson, rider from Canyon Country. Slice him towards the inside, look at that. Even though they're on four wheels, they still have ways to go side by side out there on the Supercross track. Good little two-lap race here with the white flag out. And these things may be twice as wide as motorcycles are. Nonetheless, none of these riders are afraid to go elbow to elbow as far as action goes. A race is a race, whether you're on two wheels or four wheels. And these guys all know how to go for it. Keep in mind, all of them are Suzuki's. So we're coming up on the tail end of the quad racer feature right here. Checkered flag is out. And these people are looking forward to one fantastic main event here at Anaheim Stadium. We've got some prep work to do as well, getting our cameras into place for the main. We talked with one of our TV producers a little earlier. Let's see what he had to say. With me, the television producer of the World Supercross Association and Stadium Motorsports events, John Bradley. John, the event itself is quite spectacular, but filming the event, is equally spectacular. It sure is. They've become real TV events, Supercross has. Uh, tonight, for example, David, we've got uh, 22 broadcast cameras here. We've got uh, crews from the three major network affiliates, ABC, CBS, NBC. We've got uh, crews from all the major cable companies, uh, ESPN, uh, WTBS Superstation, USA. We've also got local independent cameras uh, from all those stations. We've got uh, cameras and crews from Japan, from uh, Australia, from Europe. 
We uh, also have uh, uh, four cameras here from Moto Video, which is the uh, arm of the Stadium Motorsports Company, which does all the home video for Supercross. We have uh, uh, 35 millimeter cameras here tonight also for the movie Hole Shot, which is going to be released. This show is being done with seven cameras and a state-of-the-art million-dollar television truck. Uh, seven cameras, seven different locations, 60 in our crew tonight. Uh, David, I think you have to uh, look at the event, the number of cameras we have here, and, and realize that it's really become an uh, absolute TV event. Definitely newsworthy. Uh, for sure. No All right. Doubt. Thank you, John. Back to you, Greg. And thank you, David Sandfield and John Bradley. Now, the race that all of Anaheim Stadium, all 70,035 people have been waiting for, the beginning of the main event. And here we go. The gate is down, falling backwards towards the riders, and we're off to a start. Looks like Ricky Johnson and Johnny O'Mara and David Bailey getting off to a good one. Whoa, a Suzuki gets backdoored out there, coming through the first corner. Holy smoke, Burnworth. Oh, Burnworth gets knocked down by Ricky Johnson in the second corner of the race. That's the Yamaha factory pilot in the orange and black and he's under his bike. It's taken him a couple minutes to get back up. We certainly hope he's okay. You can see we got medical personnel right there on top of it, but he's getting back up and walking back towards his bike. So now let's go back to the leaders. Up in the top spot, you got Ricky Johnson in the lead. Whoa, there's another bail in the sand. That looks like Brock Lover. And indeed it is. Brock number four from El Cajon, one of the favorites to this race, can only watch as the entire rest of the field goes by him. So Ricky Johnson's got Burnworth out of the way. He's got Glover out of the way. Those are two very major riders in this race. And so Ricky can breathe a little bit easier as the green flag is out and we've got an official start. Look at the lead that RJ is sitting upon. His very first race of the 1986 season for the Honda factory. And certainly he is putting on a great show. There he is tripling the jumps, just like we saw him do earlier during qualifying. Ricky Johnson with about a four, maybe even a five second lead at this point, which is real nice to sit on in the early going of the race. During last season's event, we were running two 12 lap main events, but we threw that out for 1986 as these guys are running one winner take all main event. Whatever happens here is the basis upon which all the points and all the money is going to be going out. Number five, Ricky Johnson from El Cajon, again sitting on a nice little gap over what looked to be number 11, George Holland. What's this? Three and six, that's Bailey and O'Mara right now battling it out for what I believe is fourth place. Now moving up into third is Bailey. That'll drop O'Mara back down into fourth. I'm really surprised to see O'Mara doing as well as he is. Remember that knee of his is only at three-quarters strength at best. But Bailey right here, number six, now trying to make a move on number 11, George Holland. We'll go back to them in just a few minutes. But first, again, let's look at the big lead that Ricky Johnson is sitting on. Once again, jumping over all three of those jumps. And you can't see it from that angle, but the people sitting in the stands behind those three jumps going crazy, leaning over the rails and waving to the riders as they come by. Part of the excitement of Supercross. Everybody has a chance to get involved and cheer on their favorite riders. So it's the early going. RJ number five. Not too far away from here is where he lives. El Cajon down in the San Diego area is where Ricky comes from. He has never won a Supercross title. And he hasn't won a Supercross race well, since towards the tail end of the 1985 season. So he's a little bit overdue as far as a nice big win comes here for him. So you can bet that his factory support people are watching for him back in the pits, trying to cheer him on with their fingers and toes crossed. Ricky number five. Barely out of his team. One of the younger riders on the circuit. Still, he's got a lot of pressure on his shoulders right now. Look at the speed that he's enjoying. And the thing right now is that there are no lap riders for him to have to worry about at this stage. That's actually going to be probably his biggest test when he begins to go so fast that he actually moves around to the tail end of the pack that he left behind at the starting gate. Well, about there, you get a good shot of the difference between first and second place. You've got to go way back behind before you see our runner-up. Right now, it's a full nine seconds in between first and second place. And Ricky, well, except for that foot falling off the peg right there, running almost a letter-perfect event here at the beginning of the event. This is it, the 20-lap main event right here with Ricky Johnson running away from the pack a good nine seconds up and over second. Beautiful picture of the kind of altitude that these guys get jumping over these man-made obstacles here on the floor of Anaheim Stadium. 
you know, this is the eighth consecutive year that Anaheim Stadium has sold out. We've got beautiful 70 degree temperature out here in Southern California tonight. Ideal racing conditions. There's very little dust out on the track. And even though it's an extremely technical course with 50% more obstacles than these riders are normally used to having, well, Ricky Johnson seems to have the thing well in hand. Taking a look back behind him, you still cannot see anybody in second place. Since he's enjoying such a big lead, earlier on, Dave Stanfield had a talk with Ricky Johnson, so let's see what he was thinking about before the race. Same actor, new team. RJ, are you the same actor, and do you have a new team? Uh, I'm not the same actor. I'm a new, improved actor. Uh, it goes with the team. Um, Han was a little bit more of a polished team, and now I feel I'm a little bit more of a polished rider, so I think uh, you'll be looking for bigger and better things out of me. Okay, the advantages that uh, you have made just riding your Honda this year? Uh, just been uh, ha been having a lot more fun riding it. Um, been working a lot harder on my practice. I've, I've just, a new man, I'm motivated. It's just like I started racing all over again. Okay, the track tonight is difficult. It is tough. Is it going to be you against the track and how fast you can go and concentrate, or is it going to be you against some other riders? Well, uh, if I feel if I go out and, and put myself up against the other riders and feel that I got to beat them, that it's uh, I'm going to be beating myself into the ground. So what I'm going to do is go out and ride my own race and just uh, get around the track as fast as possible and uh, just do everything as be the best of my ability. You know, I heard one rider, he was talking about, he says, look, when you start the race, you're racing so fast, you're so hyped up, you have to keep that up for 20 laps. Oh, definitely. Everybody's worked hard, you know, this year. They're going to be fast, so... If you if you let up for uh, two minutes in a 20 minute in a 20 lap race, you're going to be done. Best of luck. Thank you very much, David. Thanks, Dave. Good interview. Now let's go back to live action. A little bit earlier, we were talking about how Ricky Johnson is going to have to start facing the back end of the pack. Sure enough, the rider he's approaching right now is the very same rider that he tangled with in the first corner of the race. Remember when he and Scott Burnworth tangled? Scott Burnworth ended up underneath his machine, and it took him quite a while to get going again. Burnworth very obviously is a lap down at this time. And right now, Ricky Johnson's job is to get around the burner just as quickly as he can so that he doesn't lose that precious nine-second lead that he has. Well, there you can see Bailey already is beginning to catch up back behind him. you got to begin to wonder, perhaps could Burnworth be a little irked at what happened early on in the race? Could he be intentionally holding number five, Ricky Johnson, back? That's part of team racing right here, and that is exactly what we're looking at. Burnworth very obviously is slowing down Ricky Johnson. There's Bailey right behind him, where before Bailey couldn't touch Johnson with a 10-foot pole. Heck, he could barely touch him with a 10-second pole. Now, here we go. He goes by the Yamaha, so he finally gets by Burnworth. Look at that. Burnworth pulled by within a matter of moments for David Bailey right there. Kind of rams that point home. So we've got Ricky Johnson in the lead, but now instead of nine seconds by, Bailey's right next to him. Holy smoke, he wastes no time at going for the jugular. Goes right for the lead right there, and Johnson on the inside line has got guts. Look at this. Side by side into the corner. A wide open straightaway in front of him, and there's no holding back into the big berm. Now they'll approach the triples. Whoa! There's the difference between first and second place as Ricky Johnson did all three and Bailey chose only to do two. Now probably a safety factor there. Reason why David didn't want to land on top of Ricky had Ricky not gone for all three of them at once. Whoa! Some tight racing going on right here. Yeah, get out of the way, photographer. We want to get a look at this. It's the race for first place. This is the closest we have ever seen our top two finishers here tonight. Number five in the blue jersey from Honda, Ricky Johnson, also on a Honda. Number six, David Bailey right back behind him as they cross the finish line. That's a lap rider they're going by right there. Number 10, A.J. Whiting, he's at least one lap down. All along the side of the track, friends cheering them on, waving their fists, pointing to their heads, saying, think, guys, think. we got the youngster, and although he's not old, you've got to call him the oldster. David Bailey, of course, has been around for quite a long time, the two-time Grand National Champion. But Ricky Johnson is only this season beginning his rapid climb up through the ranks. Look at that, over the triples, and this time David Bailey makes all three of the triples as well. Remember, since they are on the same factory team, that means they won't be taking any unnecessary chances as far as their racing goes when they get side by side. Nonetheless, only one of these two riders can take home the first place check and, of course, all the first place glory. And so, well, you know that they're going to be going for each other should they go side by side. They're just not going to try anything too sneaky on each other. 
Again, we're looking at those monster roots. Wow, a great pass the way that Bailey went through there on the outside of the sand. He went a lot higher than Ricky, and Ricky very nearly T-boned him right there in the corner. So take back everything I said about those guys. They're going hog wild for the lead. It's an all-out battle for first place. Teammates or no teammates, only one of them can take home the title. And number six, David Bailey, sitting on top of it right now. Again, having to wind his way through the clogged traffic at the tail end of the pack here. Number five is the only guy in camera view right now who is on the same lap. Everybody else, they're at least one lap down. It's a wide open one-two punch. Racing for the lead, David Bailey from Axton, Virginia, number six in the red and white. Well, another bump! And this time, Johnson is going to use the loss of Bailey's momentum to his advantage as he'll take the lead right back. So Ricky, who started off the race in first place, got held back by Burnworth, then got do uh, dropped back into second place by Bailey, is able to go ahead and steamroller right back up into the top slot. Bailey not about to give up. He's less than a bike length down. It's another tight corner just before the finish line. Very nearly side by side as they go up in the air. Ricky now with only one bike length of an advantage in between first and second place. Holy smoke, you can run out of breath just talking about this thing. We sure hope you're enjoying all the action at your own home. At this point right now, it looks like we're going to have a little bit of a break in the action. David Bailey down in second place as Ricky right now enjoying, well, it's about a bike length and a half, two bike lengths in certain sections of the track. Look at this, Bailey on the inside pulls the lead and takes it back again. That's the fourth time in a lap that we've had the lead change. So at this point, give me a chance to catch my breath. We're going to take a quick commercial break and be right back. Welcome back to Anaheim Stadium. This is Greg Barbacovi along with David Stanfield and through the miracles of television. You've missed almost not a single thing at all. We've still got a super tight race for first and second place. There you can see number five, Ricky Johnson in the blue jersey, doing his best to try and regain the lead that he held for the very first part of the event. Ricky was the early leader. As a matter of fact, he and another rider tangled in the very first corner of the, of the race. Uh, Burnworth went down. Ricky held the lead for the first third. Then David Bailey began his come from behind. Those guys knuckle to knuckle right now. Here, once again on the inside, Ricky trying to take the lead back. But David Bailey says, uh-uh, move over, Sarge, and he regains the lead. So number six and number five, both of them from the very same team that hasn't stopped them from some major league bumping and grinding, though, as both of these guys have been knocking each other and hay bales trying to maintain the precious gap that both of them have held at one time or another in the top slot. There's a very unusual picture right there. Who would have ever thought that you would see number four, Brock Glover, former Supercross champ, being left, and there's Ricky Johnson, a great inside pass, and Bailey gets him back again. Holy smokes, these guys. Now Bailey comes to almost a complete stop, and Ricky Johnson's front tire almost climbed up the back of David Bailey's uh, jersey. They came to almost a dead stop in that very tight corner. Now we're back again to a three bike length advantage between first and second place, and the entire Anaheim Stadium crowd is on their feet. We've got over 70,000 people here in Southern California. The eighth year in a row that this has been a sellout. And everybody is on their feet watching first and second place. We've only got a couple laps left right here. We'll see the white flag before too much longer. You can see the spectators leaning over the bars, trying to get within view of the riders so that they can cheer on their favorites. Again, lapping another rider, and you never would expect that they would have to lap number two, Ron Lachine. He was supposed to be one of the hot dudes in this event. Ron Lachine pulls over. Very nice move on Ron's part. Sportsmanlike, he doesn't want to get in the way of the two guys that are still in the front running. Over there by the finish line. No flags yet. White flag will be out before you can say Jiminy Cricket. And first and second place have not changed. They are just as tight as ever. Going by Brock Glover on the outside. A very disappointed Brock Glover. This is not the way that Brock wanted to start his 1986 season. But the little professor, the son of a former American champion, David Bailey. Well, at this point, I can look out over the field and see that the white flag is out. So apparently we missed that last time. And everybody here in the stadium is up and cheering on their favorites. 
Of course, right now, taking a look back over his shoulder, number six, David Bailey. Boy, a long, hard-fought race for the rider coming all the way out here from Virginia, a former Supercross champion, and he's starting off the 1986 Nip and Denzo Series with a blast right here. A come-from-behind blast, nonetheless. A little tough landing right there as he's probably thinking more about the checkered flag than anything else. And here it comes, the white flag out, the checkered flag is what you see, and David the Bandit Bailey, number six, the little professor, takes a surprise come from behind win here to open up the 1986 Nip and Denzo series. So there you have it, a very tired and an almost unbelieving David Bailey as he shakes his head while approaching the pits. He gets a warm hug from his mechanic down there on the field. David Bailey will be the winner, and the crowd is ecstatic over the best Supercross race that they have seen. He gets a warm handshake from Ricky Johnson, but we're going to go to a commercial, and we'll be back right after this. Listen to these guys, the teammates, the Honda teammates looking real good up here. David Bailey coming out ahead, Rick Johnson second. David, some wild riding over here, especially in that sand pit. Yeah, that's quite a bit of an understatement, I think. Uh, I think there was a few times when Rick was about to land on me, you know, we are just jumping over each other. There were so many jumps. There was a couple times, I think right by the finish line, where I was on top of Rick. I didn't even know where he was for sure, and he just squirted out from underneath me, but uh, it was real close. We pretty much made an agreement at the starting line. We go... You know, the track's tight. We're both going really fast tonight, and if we hit each other, that's just the way it goes, you know, as long as we don't kill each other. And uh, as you can see, it was really close racing, but I'm just happy it, it turned out so good for Honda and not just for myself. Did you ever back off because he's your teammate? No. <laughs> In fact, there was one time these triples over here that I think my dad walked it off. He's got pretty accurate feet, and uh, <laughs> they're about 13 inches long. And uh, it's 65 feet across that thing, and you don't have very much of a run. There was some rocks and things. And uh, Rick and I both weren't really sure because there was a couple of lappers riding through it, and we were just over th in the air going, God, I might be dead. I might be dead when I land, but we just gave it everything we had. Great job. Nice start for the season. Thanks a lot. Thanks for all of your help, Dave. Friends, as we said before, the best Supercross racing we've ever seen. From the very first event tonight, where we saw the lead change hands over five times, to the exciting 20-lap main event, where Ricky Johnson and David Bailey put on a show that over 70,000 people are not going to forget for a long time. Now, it's off to Houston as Supercross begins its 1986 season, thanks in part to our good friends at Nippendenzo and Suzuki. On behalf of David Stanfield out there on the field, I'm Greg Barbacovi. Thanks to everybody who helped with this telecast, and we'll hope to see you next time with more Supercross action. The Nip and Denzo Supercross Special would not have been possible without Nip and Denzo Spark Plugs, the official spark plug of Supercross racing. And Suzuki, makers of the high-performance quad sport and quad racers. Suzuki, the foremost in four-wheeling. This has been a World Supercross event in association with John Bradley Entertainment.